As Israel's genocidal war on Gaza continues, conditions are worsening, especially at the Al Shifa Hospital. What is the condition of patients? Leaders of Arab and Islamic countries met over the weekend, and Palestine was on the agenda. What were the conclusions? And UK Home Secretary Suela Braverman has been fired. What is her legacy? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hundreds of people, their relatives and displaced people are in an extremely dire situation at Gaza's Al Shifa Hospital. A spokesperson for the Palestinian Health Ministry said at least 32 patients have died over the past few days. Now, Israeli forces are claiming that there is a so-called safe corridor for patients, but many of them are unwell and need assistance, say media reports. The Al Shifa Hospital, which is the largest medical facility in the besieged strip, was forced to suspend operations on the morning of November 11th after it ran out of fuel. We go to Abdul for details. Abdul, uh, Israel's attacks continuing relentlessly as another week starts and a lot of focus now on the humanitarian situation, especially after reports, very, you know, uh, scary, very horrifying reports coming from the Al Shifa hospital as well regarding the situation of patients. So maybe could you first take us through a ground update, what's happening? In the last few days, Israel has been targeting Al Shifa and other hospitals in northern Gaza city, particularly after its ground troops have taken kind of uh, control of the larger territory and they have been claiming that uh, Al-Shifa hospital in particular have been used by Hamas for uh, carrying out as a, as a headquarter to carry out all the attacks ever since October uh, 7 and before and therefore they want to want to clear it that that's their claim of course which has been disputed if you see uh, 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 since it is one of the biggest hospitals in the uh, northern Gaza Strip uh, which has uh, which has the most uh, advanced facilities given the larger problem with the health uh, infrastructure in the region since the Israeli blockade for more than uh, one and a half decades now. Uh, uh, therefore, a large number of people were, have been basically treated in that hospital ever since the attacks started, the bombing started. More than 5,000 patients uh, were there and a, a large number of relatives and other uh, Palestinians who have been displaced by their home uh, from uh, by the bomb Israeli bombings from their homes have also been taking shelter there. So this allegation that uh, Hamas has been uh, using that uh, particular hospital for carrying out attacks, of course, is a bogus uh, uh, claim made by Israel and which has been proved time and again. Uh, 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 but despite all those things and despite the repeated uh, repeated uh, claims and warnings given by the health officials there and uh, international organizations like Red Cross and um, UNRWA saying that uh, the hospital uh, needs to be preserved and need to be not targeted by the Israeli uh, bombing and the ground offensive, despite all those warnings, uh, First, it has basically bombed the vicinities of the uh, hospital. It has targeted the hospital on many uh, occasions, which has basically led to, uh, the, of course, the destruction of whatever infrastructure was there. There, there are also, uh, of course, because of the lack of fuel, the, the electricity supply has been disrupted. That has led to the, the death of many uh, uh, infant, infants uh, because the uh, their... Uh, the life-saving uh, mechanism, which basically supports the newly born babies, could not function because uh, uh, there is no electricity. Uh, the patients who were trying to, Israel was claiming that they have given repeated warnings for the people to leave. But whenever they were trying to leave, they have been uh, fired at. There are, according to the reports, snipers uh, uh, around the uh, hospital, which are targeting the people who are trying to leave the hospital. There are also reports of doctors being harassed, uh, in fact, attacked uh, by the Israeli soldiers uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, some of those doctors have come up and given their testimonies in public. Um, uh, and therefore, the, in, uh, the entire infrastructure of the hospital has basically collapsed. Uh, but those who are doctors inside, they're still trying to do something. Um, 
Of course, because th that is a sheer uh, will which is basically preserving them. Otherwise, uh, for our practical purposes, it is completely uh, 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 kind of, uh, you can say, targeted and shut uh, from the Israeli perspective. And they are treating it as a target, legitimate target. And that's that explains how the snipers are there, how they are not letting people go out how they are bombing the vicinities, vicinity of the hospital and not letting any people go in and out of the hospital. Right, Abdul, also, I believe the UN marking a day of mourning because of the number of relief workers uh, who have been killed, that's also another, you know, uh, you know, very horrifying aspect to this whole conflict. The fact that humanitarian workers, people providing assistance to those the most in need have been attacked and Israel's response to that was its ambassador, I believe, speaking in the UN saying that even they even released relief workers, he was accusing them of being uh, members of Hamas, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. So for Israel, uh, ever since the, uh, the attacks started uh, on October 7, everyone, they have treated every Palestinian inside Gaza as Hamas uh, either member or sympathizer and uh, that that basically has led to uh, them completely being uh, indifferent to the repeated uh, uh, kind of concerns raised by the international organizations and the people on the ground that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, an ambulance uh, is being attacked or a medical officer basically is bombed uh, shot dead by now the ground uh, troops uh, uh, then there are a uh, complete shutting down of medical supplies uh, ever since october 20 uh, sorry october 9th uh, which basically has completely created a kind of lack of uh, basic uh, infrastructure medicine uh, in that uh, reason uh, the number of uh, see out of 20, uh, out of 50 odd hospitals which uh, gaza has uh, around 30 of them, more than 30 of them have been shut uh, in the last uh, one month and so. And therefore, uh, the remaining hospitals are also not in a very good condition because there is not enough medical supplies uh, coming. Whatever aid which is uh, filtering through, through the Gaza, uh, sorry, Rafa border is not enough to kind of run those hospitals. All, uh, as I, as we said, uh, as we discussed earlier, the, because of the lack of the lack of fuel, the basic uh, uh, hospital uh, machines, which are required to kind of uh, kind of medical equipments to save lives or to kind of use them uh, to kind of treat patients, none of them are functioning. So uh, most of these things are done deliberately uh, because, as you rightly pointed out, Israeli ministers, Israeli ambassadors uh, in, on international fora have justified saying that these medical uh, official, officials, the aid workers which work with uh, Red Cross or the Red, Red Crescent or UNRWA or any other uh, group uh, which is working on the ground, are all basically uh, members of Hamas and they are aiding Hamas. They are trying to basically shield them. Uh, Hamas is using the hospitals and the ambulances and the doctors basically to kind of shield uh, their operations. And uh, therefore, every target in uh, in Gaza is a quote unquote legitimate target. And that has basically, that explains the uh, uh, number of uh, uh, if you see, there are reports coming that apart from those who are wounded, uh, there are other uh, uh, diseases breaking out in in Gaza. Which, which basic, uh, of course, it has also to, something to do with the uh, co complete collapse of the civil infrastructure, sanitation, water supply, and so on and so forth, and the blockade, of course. But it has also to, to do with the complete lack of any medical care. Uh, uh, so uh, whatever is available is used for emergency care, for the, uh, to treat wounded and uh, 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 um, people who are uh, victims of uh, Israeli bombings or, or the ground troops attacks. And therefore, the other diseases, uh, uh, other uh, uh, things which, are, uh, which need immediate attention is by and large uh, not uh, taken care of. And that explains the, uh, of, apart from other things, explains the uh, complete collapse of health services uh, and a, a greater uh, rise of uh, different kinds of um, epidemics in, uh, in, in Gaza at this moment. 
Right, Abdul, thank you so much for that analysis, but please do stay back because we are coming back to a very connected story. Leaders of Arab and Islamic countries took part in a keenly awaited meeting over the weekend, during which Palestine was the subject of discussion. The meeting took place in Riyadh and the attendance of the Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad was especially significant. The joint communique warned Israel of the disastrous consequences of its war crime. We go back to Abdul for more details. Abdul, so coming back, a very significant uh, meeting, especially considering that both the Arab countries and the OIC uh, sort of, it is kind of a combined meeting at this point. Very challenging questions and before the leaders of many of these countries who have taken a wide variety of positions, let's be uh, clear about that. Although on, on all these, in all these countries, in the streets, in any kind of popular space, you see this massive solidarity with the Palestinian people. So a real question mark for many of these leaders. So what was the broad sort of conclusion of the summit or where were the directions in which it was going? Well, uh, in the initial, uh, uh, pro when the initial round of discussions were happening, of course, there were proposals put forward by, because this is a meeting which includes both the Arab countries, the uh, members of the Arab League, which are 22 countries, and OIC, which, which, which is the larger body, and which includes uh, countries uh, uh, such as Indonesia, in Asia, and then African, a large number of African countries as well. So, of course, given the wide variety of countries which were represented in the summit, uh, there were different kinds of proposals coming in. And some of them, of course, were pitching for a, a very strong uh, uh, kind of step against Israeli uh, attacks on Gaza, particularly Iran, uh, asking for a complete boycott by all the members of the OIC, which is more than 57 countries uh, from across the world. And uh, apart, it is not limited to the uh, uh, armed uh, uh, sanctions, sanctions on the arms delivery uh, and other military equipment delivery, but also a complete boycott of it. But of course, uh, the, since this is a wide range of countries uh, uh, participating in the meeting, some of them have very close relationship with both the US and uh, Israel as well, which basically uh, led to a, a much more, uh, you can say, a milder version of uh, 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 kind of uh, summit, a joint communique, which was issued at, uh, uh, after the meeting. And But despite the fact that it is milder than what initially, what was initially proposed, this, were, this is still a, a step ahead in a sense that uh, despite the fact that there are countries, uh, as I said before, which have very close relationship with the U.S. and Israel, some of them have very close relationship with Israel as well, none of them were uh, able to reject the idea uh, that what is happening in Gaza is not Israel's right to self-defense. And they all agreed that this is not a justification. It is basically an occupying force which is using uh, a, an incident of attack to retaliate or to kind of take revenge against the people uh, uh, of all, all Palestinian people. All of them uh, agreed to call it collect, uh, what is happening in Gaza as a collective punishment, including both the attacks and the blockade, and uh, uh, asked... I, ICC and other uh, international groups to basically start an investigation for that. So give all 757 countries agreeing on such a description of what is happening in Gaza is a, uh, is a great achievement. In this, uh, we should remember that, as I said before, that the, there are countries represented here uh, in this group which do not uh, share this opinion, at least so far, they have not uh, said such things in public. That is one. Apart from that, uh, uh, the communique is a very long communique. It also talks about um, uh, immediate need for uh, starting an a, a, a international peace conference, which will lead to a two-state solution, agreeing that without a two-state solution, there is no peace and stability in the region, and there is no possibility of any normalization of relationships with either Israel or uh, if, if this continues, they also uh, very much underlined that if this continues, this there some of them, co um, uh, the community called it a biased uh, implementation of international law. And if this continues, the relationship between the uh, members of OIC and the US will also be, because they did not name US, of course, but th that was the hint that Israel is doing what it is doing because there are certain countries which are letting it do such things. And therefore, if it continues, uh, 
the, their relationship might also get affected. So it's the, in a way, it is a strong statement, of course, uh, uh, sh sort of any concrete action, uh, uh, but uh, uh, rhetorically, it is, uh, uh, it is something which, which needs to be uh, seen in the larger context, and it is a, a, a radical step forward. Right. Abdul, of course, uh, interesting, uh, very briefly to go back to that point, interesting that uh, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi was uh, at that meeting, I believe, which is, uh, is uh, you know, a very rare visit of Iranian President to Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, do we see that trend of, uh, you know, closer integration, not, in I wouldn't say integration, but closer cooperation between countries which are earlier in very different blocks, that trend is actually strengthening as a result of what has been happening over the past month? Uh, of course, this is the first uh, visit of an Iranian president to Saudi Arabia in more than a decade, 11 years in fact. So, uh, the process was started in March. The, uh, what generally is called rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia has uh, led to a kind of an unfolding of uh, events, which basically, and, and if we see what is happening ever since the uh, war in Gaza started, uh, Iran and Saudis are, have been coordinating their uh, uh, their clear indication that they have been coordinating their responses uh, to uh, uh, not only uh, to the what is uh, to, in the region but also on the global forums and that is something which has which is something unique uh, given the history which uh, saudi arabia and iran had uh, has for all these years uh, and if you see in that context uh, syria was also invited again for the this oic summit uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, so Syria, Iran being a permanent uh, uh, and uh, kind of welcome uh, presence to all these forums where uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, other countries which are not very friendly, which have not been very friendly to uh, uh, both these countries uh, is a sign uh, that, of course, a, a greater integ a kind of uh, integration, at least on regional issues, uh, is happening. Greater coordination on re regional issues is happening. And, and this in particular is very significant uh, given the, the, the nature of the uh, uh, Palestinian issue uh, and the U.S. role in it. So uh, U.S. has been very clear about kind of uh, uh, not letting the Arab countries unite behind a stand. And of course, uh, 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 trying to alienate Israel, uh, Iran completely from uh, uh, the, the group of countries which it considers to be uh, close to it. And, and all those attempts, uh, Austin visiting, uh, Blinken visiting, Biden visiting the region, going to uh, going and meeting uh, 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 people in Iraq, people in uh, leadership in Iraq, leadership in Saudi Arabia, leadership in Jordan, uh, given particularly these three countries, which post 2003 uh, have been quite uh, uh, US, pro US. Uh, if you see the responses and the way have they have they have kind of uh, a kind of uh, some kind of symphony with is uh, Iranian position uh, on on Palestine, this is a clear indication that uh, the U.S. efforts to dominate the reason the way it used to dominate uh, 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 till now uh, is not working, and 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 there is a growing uh, uh, kind of realization among the countries in the region that they need to kind of uh, coordinate their stands to, uh, so that external intervention, as they call it, some of them, uh, is minimized and the countries of the region can have much more assertive, independent uh, positions on the issues which matters to them and to uh, the, peop uh, the people uh, uh, there. Well, Abdul, thank you so much for that analysis. We'll keep watching this space as, you know, I think uh, the, there's a lot of potential in terms of how many of these governments might move. Thank you so much. And finally, after an extremely controversial career as Home Secretary, Suela Breverman has been fired by British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. The action is believed to be due to an article she wrote which is critical of the police for supposedly being too lenient with protesters who express solidarity with Palestine. But this is not the first outrageous statement that Breverman has made and she's often made a lot of offensive comments about asylum seekers and refugees and her record as Home Secretary has been severely criticized by activists. We go to Anish for more. Anish, a lot of the media reporting is going to be focusing on David Cameron's return as the to do mainstream political life, all this talk about political comeback, etc., etc. But the key point we need to sort of focus on is, I think, Swela Bremen's record, uh, you know, especially her recent statements, but also build, which is building on a long trajectory of extremely 
uh, offensive remarks against various sections. But for the benefit of viewers, could you maybe first take us through why the Home Secretary of a country like the UK was fired by the Prime Minister? Uh, well, the most immediate thing is the fact that she uh, criticized the police for apparent uh, double standards uh, when it comes to uh, pro-Palestinian protests. Uh, but the thing is, like, uh, she wasn't uh, really stating the truth. We know for a fact that there has been... Uh, let's, know, let's be clear, when she was criticizing double standards, she was saying the police should have been exactly. more violent against. Exactly, ah. exactly. Like that... Uh, the police should have really cracked down on the Palestinian protesters. But we know that that's not uh, the case. The police have been uh, not very friendly for uh, the pro-Palestinian cause, especially uh, with some of the uh, you know hounding of some of the activists and organizers of heated protests. But that aside, uh, she has uh, very clearly gone against the government in many ways uh, with this criticism and that has essentially and because the home department is the one that is leading the police essentially she pretty much uh, criticizes not just her own government but her ministry as well so it was a you know a very confused set of uh, statement and this is the most jarring thing that the fact that she her criticism of the police for whatever reasons like uh, and like despite the fact that it, it is not based on facts, uh, was the reason, was the last straw for the government to actually take her out, uh, considering the she has said and done far worse things uh, over her tenure as the Home Secretary, and uh, not uh, least of all against immigrants, uh, being an immigrant herself, the irony uh, of it just flows through us, but uh, being an, uh, against immigrants, against asylum seekers, against people uh, who are seeking refuge uh, by going through a very precarious and dangerous uh, voyage across the Mediterranean and uh, obviously being the most uh, upfront and the most honest of the conservative parties. Uh, policies and being very honest about its policies and defending it, whatever uh, whatever criticism that might be uh, held against her, uh, that none of these factors actually really uh, affected her stand or her standing within the government. And that's the most important thing I feel. And it's quite clear with the replacement, it's not that different. It's just that the person might be more diplomatic when it comes to, uh, you know, stating some of the things that she might have done in a more crude manner. Uh, that aside, it's also uh, a very clear indication of how desperate the Sunak government is. Uh, recent Bible uh, uh, routes that they have lost seeds that they have held for decades even, and to pretty much any uh, you know significant opposition party that might exist in those uh, constituencies uh, has really alerted the government to its growing unpopularity among the people and the fact that its policies are really not translating to any kind of support on the ground and this attempt to reshuffle the cabinet uh, in you know in even bringing back Cameron who was pretty much kept on the back benches for so long uh, clearly shows how desperate this government is right now to try to shore up some amount of support that they might have among, you know, the more conservative or right-wing voters. Anish, thank you much for that quick update. Uh, like you said, I think nothing really changes. Uh, there's no, uh, Breverman was not an outlier in terms of her policy preferences, maybe in terms of some of her statements, but definitely not in terms of what her policy framework was. And uh, she'll, of course, I think, always be remembered for especially her Rwanda policy, which was, I think, one of the most inhuman uh, you know, proposals that came at that time. Thank you so much for us. We'll come back to you later. And that's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. Do come back tomorrow for another episode. Meanwhile, also visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.